Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, August the 24th. Today is the Feast of St. Bartholomew. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 2 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you, for if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you, that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now if anyone has caused pain, he has not caused it to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough, so you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those whom are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ." Our Book of Concord reading tonight is from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 4. This is Part 5 of 6 on Article 5 on Justification. This is the conclusion of the section called Faith in Christ Justifies, and then we will begin, We Obtain Forgiveness of Sins Through Faith Alone in Christ. The term alone, sola, offends some people, even though Paul says in Romans 3.28, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. He says in Ephesians 2.8-9, It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. He says in Romans 3.24, 
justified by his grace as a gift. If the exclusive term alone displeases, let them remove from Paul also the exclusives freely, not of works, it is the gift, and so on. For these also are exclusives. It is, however, the notion of merit that we exclude. We do not exclude the word or sacraments as the adversaries falsely charge against us. We have said earlier that faith is conceived from the word. We honor the ministry of the word, the preaching office and word, in the highest degree. Love and works must also follow faith. Therefore, they are not excluded so that they do not follow faith, but confidence in the merit of love or of works is excluded in justification. We will clearly show this. We obtain forgiveness of sins through faith alone in Christ. Editor's Note The Bible teaches that mankind stands entirely damned before God. He demands that we be righteous and holy in his sight without exception. Certainly, we are able to perform works that are considered worthy in the eyes of the world, Apology 4.23, but these are insufficient for God's requirements and cannot atone for our sins. There is nothing within us that merits his grace and mercy. As sinners, how can we stand before a holy, righteous, and just God? We can, but only by his grace. God restores us to a right relationship with himself through Christ Jesus. By grace, God justifies us through faith in his Son. The biblical definition of grace is God's unmerited favor in Christ, his love active in the salvation brought about by Christ, Titus 2.11. Saving or justifying grace is the undeserved kindness that God gives sinful people because of what Christ has done, John 3.16, Titus 3.4 and 5. Grace stands in stark contrast to the works that human beings do. The Bible clearly teaches that since our salvation is purely by grace, all human works are entirely excluded from justification. Romans 11.6, Ephesians 2.8 and 9. This biblical definition of grace is important. If we relied on ourselves for justification before God, one of three things would happen. We could despair of our efforts to earn God's favor, we could become self-righteous hypocrites, or we could completely reject our Savior. In the Roman Church, both then and now, grace is more of a quality or power than that God infuses into man's natural goodness, allowing him to reach a point where he pleases God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church carefully states that man is involved in the process of his own justification. Through grace, God begins the process, but it is up to man to complete his justification before God. Man's good works, begun by God's grace, merit for him a right relationship with God. True, it is claimed that these merits are ultimately derived from the operation of the Holy Spirit, but in the end, man contributes to his own justification. This is a dangerous mixture of grace and works. In this system, how can we be sure of a right standing with God? How can we know if we are justified? We obtain forgiveness of sins through, Christ, through faith alone in Christ. We think even the adversaries acknowledge that the forgiveness of sins is necessary first in justification. We are all under sin, therefore we reason as follows. To receive the forgiveness of sins is to be justified according to Psalm 32.1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. By faith alone in Christ, not through love, not because of love or works, we receive the forgiveness of sins, although love follows faith. Therefore, by faith alone we are justified. We understand justification as the making of a righteous person out of an unrighteous one, or that a person is regenerated. It will become easy to state the minor pre premise that we receive forgiveness of sin by faith, not by love, if we know how forgiveness of sin happens. With great indifference, the adversaries dispute whether forgiveness of sins and infusion of grace are the same change. Being useless men, they did not know how to answer this question. In the forgiveness of sins, the terrors of sin and of eternal death must be overcome in the heart. Paul testifies about this in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, and 57. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, sin terrifies consciences. This happens through the law, which shows God's wrath against sin. But we gain the victory through Christ. How? Through faith, when we comfort ourselves by confidence in the mercy promised for Christ's sake. Therefore, we prove the minor premise. God's wrath cannot be appeased if we set our own works against it, for Christ has been set forth as an atoning sacrifice, so that for his sake the Father may be reconciled to us. 
But Christ is not received as a mediator except by faith. Therefore, by faith alone, we receive forgiveness of sins when we comfort our hearts with confidence in the mercy promised for Christ's sake. Likewise, Paul says in Romans 5, 2, Through him we have also obtained access, and adds, by faith. Therefore, we are reconciled to the Father and receive forgiveness of sins when we are comforted with confidence in the mercy promised for Christ's sake. The adversaries regard Christ as mediator and atoning sacrifice for this reason. He has merited the habit of love. They do not encourage us to use him now as mediator. They act as though Christ were certainly in the grave. They imagine that we have access to God through our own works. They think they merit this habit through these, and afterward, by this love, come to God. Is this not to bury Christ altogether and to take away the entire teaching of faith? Paul, on the contrary, teaches that we have access to God, that is, reconciliation through Christ. To show how this happens, he adds that we have access by faith. By faith, for Christ's sake, we receive forgiveness of sins. We cannot set up our own love and our own works against God's wrath. Second, it is certain that sins are forgiven for the sake of Christ as our atoning sacrifice, whom God put forward as a propitiation, Romans 3.25. Furthermore, Paul adds, by faith. Therefore, this atonement benefits us in this way. We receive the mercy promised in him by faith and set it against God's wrath and judgment. To the same effect, it is written in Hebrews 4:14 4, and 16, Since then we have a great high priest, let us then with confidence draw near. The apostle tells us to come to God, not with confidence in our own merits, but with confidence in Christ as the high priest. The apostle requires faith. Third, Peter says in Acts 10.43, To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. How could this be said more clearly? Peter says we receive forgiveness of sins through Christ's name, that is, for his sake. It is not for the sake of our merits, not for the sake of our contrition, attrition, love, worship, or works. He adds, when we believe in him. Peter requires faith. For we cannot receive Christ's name except by faith. Besides, he refers to the agreement of all the prophets. This is truly to cite the authority of the church. We will speak again later on this topic when describing repentance. Fourth, forgiveness of sins is something promised for Christ's sake. It cannot be received except through faith alone. For a promise cannot be received except by faith alone. Romans 4.16 says, That is why... It depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed. It is as though he says, if the matter were to depend on our merits, the promise would be uncertain and useless, for we never could determine when we would have done have enough merit. Experienced consciences can easily understand this, so Paul says in Galatians 3.22, But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. He takes merit away from us because he says that all are guilty and included under sin. Then he adds that the promise, namely forgiveness of sins and justification, is given, and he shows how the promise could be received, by faith. This reasoning, derived from the nature of a promise, is the chief reasoning in Paul and is often repeated. Nor can anything be devised or imagined by with which Paul's argument can be overthrown. Therefore, let not good minds allow themselves to be forced from the conviction that we receive forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake, through faith alone. In this, they have sure and firm consolation against the terrors of sin, against eternal death, and against all the gates of hell. Tomorrow evening, we will conclude Article 4 on Justification with a section called Scripture Affirms This Teaching, as if we have not covered enough scripture that affirms this teaching. They will go into more detail. And that will... Oh, you know what? We're going to have a seventh part because I can't read. Yep, we have, we'll have seven parts. So Tuesday evening, scripture affirms this teaching. And then Wednesday evening, we will hear about how the church fathers have read the scriptures, read the confessions, and affirm this teaching also. So we have two more nights in Article 4. And once again, today is the Feast of St. Bartholomew, so a little bit about 
him. St. Bartholomew, or Nathaniel, as he is called in St. John's Gospel, was one of the first of Jesus' twelve disciples. His home was in the town of Cana in Galilee, John 21.2, where Jesus performed his first miracle. He was invited to become one of the twelve by Philip, who told him that they had found the Messiah in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, John 1.45. Bartholomew's initial hesitation to believe, because of Jesus' Nazareth background, was quickly replaced by a clear, unequivocal declaration of faith. You are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel, John 1.49. He was present with the other disciples, John 21, 1-13, when they were privileged to see and converse and eat with their risen Lord and Savior. According to some early church fathers, Bartholomew brought the gospel to Armenia, where he was martyred by being flayed alive. We join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore, we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers. Bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church in the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witness among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you, and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in a right knowledge of you, so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels, and be a strong help to all who need you, for the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, chose Bartholomew to be an apostle to preach the blessed gospel. Grant that your church may love what he believed and preach what he taught. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.